This hearing will come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on undermining democracy, Kremlin tools to malign political influence. Without objection, all members have five days to submit statements and questions, extraneous materials, uh, and the like for the record, subject to the length limitation and the rules. Uh, I'll now make an opening statement and turn it over to the ranking member for his opening statement, but I'd like uh, to ask, without objection, unanimous consent, that we might, my remarks might be extended a bit because we're going to show a film, uh, a short film, two and a half minute film, uh, that I think will shed some light on what we're discussing today. I'd like to welcome you all to the hearing on Russia and specifically the Kremlin's tools of political influence around the world. Much of our work so far in the subcommittee is focused on our need as the United States to remain a leader uh, in standing up for democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, and the importance of working together with our allies who share our commitment to these ideals. Today we continue along that vein and have before us expert witnesses who will explain how Putin's Russia undermines democratic processes and institutions around the world through various means such as illicit finance, so-called dark money, and corruption. It's interesting that uh, as we're focused on uh, military aggression in places like Georgia and Ukraine and we're focused on cyber threats, uh, the idea of the corrupt influence operation as Dr. Carpenter so called it, hasn't received the same attention, uh, but it's so important in, in realizing what's going on and the threats to our democracy, particularly by Russia. So these issues are among other interventions that are, are attempts to weaken public discourse around elections and affect the results. We, are, we ourselves have experience with this. Uh, Russia intervened in our elections in 2016. With greater awareness now, after this experience, officials from the European and EU, EU elections have been vigilant in working to protect their electoral systems and monitor for attempts at undermining their democracies. More systemic ways, uh, uh, however, uh, are used. Uh, and using illicit financing and corruption to influence political actors and parties is one of them. Just this weekend, Austria's vice chancellor resigned after a shocking video was released seemingly showing him voluntarily engaging with an individual posing as a member, a family member, uh, of a Russian oligarch to advance his far-right political party. We're still learning about this video and the circumstances behind how this exchange came to occur. Uh, the Russian government has asserted that they have nothing to do with that. Uh, we will hear from our witnesses uh, in their testimony how Russia does use, in instance, agents to have that degree of separation. Whether that's the case here or not uh, is to be determined, but it'll be important to analyze this as one graphic way uh, that this can be done. The vice Chan chancellor in question has apologized for aspects of his behavior and has resigned over the weekend. And the chancellor has called for snap elections to take place. I do believe through though that regardless of the unfolding details, that this is an important glimpse for everyone who's been working on these issues into what kind of corruption occurs and what it could look like. We have an excerpt of the video and with unanimous consent, we'll play it for the subcommittee now. Uh, just note that if you're watching it, Cronin refers to a prominent uh, newspapers and Strabag uh, is a major Austrian construction company. So if we could uh, cue this and uh, take a few minutes, a couple of minutes to look at this film. Ich muss erklären, dass das nicht rechnungslos ist. 
So, da gibt es bei uns in der Krone zack, 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 diese drei, drei, vier, drei, vier Leute, die müssen ja, Buchstaben, die müssen drei, vier Leute, die müssen die Hauptstellen jetzt Und der Grüner, ja. der ist gut so. Wie ich meine, der ist gut so. Und wir holen gleich einmal fünf neue Reihen, die wir aufbauen. Ja. Und das ist das. Ist das. Ja. Schau, und da sind wir genau beim Thema Stammwald, Autobahnung. Du, das erste in einer Regierungsbeteiligung, was ich auch dazu sagen kann, ist, da hat uns einer gewinn auf der Ebene. So, okay. Und da haben wir einen riesen Volumen ja, von interessanten infrastrukturellen Veränderungen, wenn da eine Qualität da ist und ein qualitativer Anbieter da ist. Ja, wenn der erste Person ist, ist der höchste Also, ja, Entschuldigung, dann sage ich Ihnen, soll sie nämlich eine Firma, die die Strafbar gründen, weil alle staatlichen ja. Aufwände, die jetzt die Strafbar kriegt, sind Ziel ja, dann so. This whole situation underscores two things in particular. First, that corruption around elections and political power is real. Whether this was a real transaction or whether anything would have come of it uh, is not taken away uh, yet uh, as, as the investigation continues. But it, it doesn't take away from the fact that this video affirms what many experts have studied, including those joining us today, that this kind of corruption happens it's more commonplace than I think we often would like to admit. Second, that once we recognize Russian malign political influence around the world for the threat that it is, we have an opportunity here. There were protests in Austria following the release of these tapes, and there's been widespread condemnation of the elected officials' blatant willingness to sacrifice important democratic principles like fair competition, government accountability, and freedom of the press. Sunlight is the greatest disinfectant. We need to support investigative journalism and transparency around campaign financing, and always be, will be sure to protect civic space for free speech and association. Whether it's a setup or actual Russian corruption transactions designed to affect internal governing or elections in a country, democracies, including the United States and our European allies, need to come together to expose corruption and illicit financing and work together to ensure that our democracies remain independent and free from malign foreign influence. So I look forward to addressing these points in detail today and to hear from our witnesses on their work analyzing how the Kremlin uses various means, financial or otherwise, to undermine the stability of democracies around the world. We will not only discuss the tools the Kremlin uses, but also what can be done about it together with our allies. Sanctions are an important piece of this discussion, and I hope we discuss how we can strengthen our own financial systems and democratic institutions while also strengthening our public discourse and media literacy so that we're less vulnerable to these kind of attacks and interference. With that, I now turn to the ranking member for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I thank this panel for joining us today. Obviously, the video was very disturbing, and hopefully it serves as a warning into the future for uh, anybody that would think to do likewise. Um, I don't believe any member in this room would deny the fact that Russia, led by Mr. Putin, is a destabilizing factor in this world. The Russians have developed an advanced set of tools to apply pressure on democracies around the world, and they've shown their willingness to use it. Whenever Putin attempts a new maneuver, he waits to see the international community's response, and when nothing happens, he escalates. One of the first tools developed and deployed by the Kremlin was to hide behind the guise of protecting ethnic Russians to invade Georgia and Ukraine. While open hostilities between Russia and Georgia began in 2008, it was Putin's distribution of passports to Georgians earlier that laid the groundwork for Russian intervention. In Ukraine, Putin claimed that ethnic Russians were being persecuted, as a precursor for intervention. By using little green men instead of the Russian military, the Kremlin was able to deny any involvement in the invasion and occupation of Ukrainian territory. Both Ukraine and Georgia have been stalwart allies of the United States since gaining their independence. Ensuring their territorial sovereignty of these two countries is essential to European security and to American interests. When personal interests are at stake for Vladimir Putin and his allies, the Russians do not hesitate to utilize their forces to engage in international affairs. In 2015, Bashar al-Assad was losing control of Syria. He requested assistance from the Kremlin, who were more than willing and dutifully bound to protect, help protect their naval base in Syria in exchange for Russian air power 
Assad granted Putin a 50-year lease to the airbase, the same location where they've launched waves of attacks on civilian centers and hospitals, killing thousands of men, women, and children, which continues to this day. It's not just in Europe or the Middle East where Russia is attempting to exert their influence. Earlier this year, we saw the Kremlin provide Nicolas Maduro with soldiers to protect Russian investment in Venezuelan energy sector and provoke the United States by getting involved in our hemisphere. The Russian Federation has long used energy as a weapon to coerce, manipulate, and create conflict around the world. One of my growing concerns is how European and Eurasian countries have become reliant on Russian gas and oil without a domestic backup. Though almost completed the, through the almost completed Nord Stream 2 pipeline project, Russia will soon control our European allies' energy markets. That's why I introduced H.R. 1616, the European Energy Security and Diversification Act with Chairman Keating. This legislation would help our partners defend themselves from the malign activities of Russia by developing and diversifying their own energy sources. I hope our Senate colleagues can pick this up and pass it quickly. While hindsight's 2020, we must be able to learn from our mistakes and adapt. Prior to the 2016 elections, Russia engaged in one of the most sophisticated inf information operations to date against the United States. This past February, the Russians tried to halt the democratic progress being made in Moldova by manipulating their elections. As a result, the pro-Russian Socialist Party won 35 seats in the election, while the pro-Western Democratic Party won 30. We must remain vigilant, and I have no doubt that Russia will continue to do similar attacks on democracies going forward. Just this week, the EU will be holding their parliamentary elections. The Russians will look at every possible avenue to sow discord and division across the continent to further strain democracy in Europe. It further shows us why the topic of this hearing is so important. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about Russia's malign activities today and how the United States can best defend itself and go on the offense against them. And one of the things I think is extremely important is simply exposing Russian tactics to be able to disinfect against them. If you're looking at Twitter or Facebook or social media and you see a story that looks crazy, it probably is. It's probably not true. And unfortunately, we live in a moment where people automatically accept the narrative that they're predisposed to instead of thinking critically about if this is a disinformation campaign. So again, I thank the chairman for calling this important hearing. I thank the witnesses for being here, and I yield back the balance of my time. Well, I could thank the ranking member for his comments, and uh, I'd like to thank our witnesses, uh, uh, extraordinary group of witnesses here in the panel on the subject matter, uh, and I'll introduce them in order. Dr. Michael Carpenter is a senior director at the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement uh, and a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. He previously served in the Pentagon as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense with responsibility for Russia, Ukraine, Eurasia, the Balkans, and conventional arms control. He also served in the White House as a foreign policy advisor to Vice President Joe Biden, as well as on the National Security Council as the director for Russia. Laura Rosenberger is the director of the Alliance for Securing Democracy and senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Prior to that, she served at the State Department and the National Security Council. Heather Conley is a senior vice president for Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic, and director of the Europe program for the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Ms. Conley previously served as the deputy assistant secretary at the Department of State's Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs. Peter Duran is the president and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis and and served as a Foreign Affairs Fellow in Congress and as a George C. Marshall Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. I appreciate all of you being here. Uh, I look forward to this testimony. Uh, please limit your testimony as best you can uh, within the five-minute uh, arena, and without objection, your prepared written statements will be made part of the record. I'll now go to Dr. Carpenter for his statement. Chairman Keating, Ranking Member Kinzinger, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you very much for this opportunity to testify today on the subject of the Kremlin's tools of malign political influence. I also couldn't imagine three better uh, co-witnesses to be here on the stage with me. Uh, today, Russia is doubling down on malign influence operations across Europe and North America, but we remain unprepared, underfunded, and often ignorant of the threat. Furthermore, it's not just Russia 
but also China and other state and non-state actors whose influence and destabilization operations pose a threat to our democracy. To deal with this threat, we urgently need to focus more resources on rooting out Russia's malign networks, addressing our own massive vulnerabilities, especially to foreign dark money, and imposing greater costs on Russia when the Kremlin is caught interfering in our democratic process. Russia's subversive attacks on our democracy can be grouped into three main categories, cyber operations, information warfare, and corrupt influence operations. Today, I will focus on influence operations, or what in Russian intelligence jargon are called active measures. Active measures are, are occurring with increasing frequency. I won't review all the cases cited in my written testimony, but a few examples should suffice to give a flavor for what we're dealing with. In Lithuania in 2004, a Russian oligarch contributed $400,000 to the campaign of a presidential candidate who won the election but was later impeached and removed from office by the Lithuanian parliament after it was shown that the oligarch had improperly been given Lithuanian citizenship. In France in 2014, far-right presidential candidate Marine Le Pen received a 9 million euro loan from a bank owned by a Russian oligarch. In the Netherlands in 2015, Russian proxies posing as Ukrainians uh, tried to sway a referendum against Ukraine's free trade agreement with the EU. In the UK, Brexit's biggest financial backer had numerous meetings with Russian embassy officials and businessmen who offered attractive investment opportunities. In the Central African Republic, Libya, Sudan, Madagascar, Syria, and Venezuela, Russian private contractors provide services ranging from personal security to election support in return for access and money. Russia's state-owned enterprises, Rosneft, Gazprom, Rosatom, etc., regularly offer foreign government officials preferential deals in return for influence. In Montenegro, Russia's military intelligence service, the GRU, crossed the line from influence to destabilization operations when it tried to foment a violent coup d'etat against the country's prime minister, in October of 2016. Similarly, in Greece, a former Duma member and billionaire oligarch personally funded violent protests against a historic agreement uh, between Greece and North Macedonia that paved the way for the latter uh, country to join NATO. All of these operations are funded through a financial ecosystem that makes use of laundered money. The Panama Papers and other sources have showed how offshore networks of shell companies and shady financial institutions have enabled Russian oligarchs, officials, and organized crime signets to launder syndicates to launder billions of dollars into Western financial institutions. So the question is, how do we stop Russian malign influence? I would group our responses into three buckets of measures, law enforcement, legislative, and cost imposition. First, we need to root out illicit Russian networks. To do this, we need better coordination between our domestic law enforcement agencies and our national security apparatus. Too often, one hand doesn't know what the other is doing. A standing interagency task force on malign Russian influence chaired by an NSC senior director would help address this problem. Second, we urgently need to address our own vulnerabilities by closing crucial gaps in governance. The most important is our campaign finance system which is so opaque that we don't even have an inkling how much foreign dark money is sloshing around the system. Legislation to identify the beneficial owners of limited liability companies is also necessary and urgent, since shell companies are often used to mask illicit financial transactions. Stricter anti-money laundering regulations are needed to tighten illicit financial flows, and more transparency is needed for uh, high-end real estate transactions. This also means more resources are needed for the Treasury Department's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. Finally, law firms need to be subjected to greater transparency so that attorney-client privilege cannot be used as a loophole through which foreign entities channel illicit funds to U.S. legal representatives. A number of bills have been drafted to address these vulnerabilities, but none so far has been passed into law. 
Finally, the third bucket of measures involves imposing greater costs on Russia for its interference in our democratic process. In my view, we need to consider much more forceful actions, such as full blocking sanctions on select Russian banks. It's time to recognize that trying to change Russia's behavior through, quote unquote, targeted sanctions on this or that oligarch or official isn't gonna work. It's time to impose real costs on Russia, and we have the tools to do so. Thank you for, for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Ms. Rosenberger. Thank you so much, Chairman Keating, Ranking Member Kinzinger, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to address you today. I submitted my full statement for the record, but let me highlight key points on Russia's operations to undermine our democracy and what we need to do to address it. These operations employ five primary asymmetric tools information operations, cyber attacks, malign financial influence, political and social subversion, and strategic economic coercion. They exploit democracy's openness while weaponizing societal and institutional vulnerabilities, and election interference is but one component. I'm glad to address two underappreciated tools today, malign financial and coercive economic tactics that Russia uses in Europe. These activities threaten U.S. national security, by undermining cohesion of NATO and the EU, encouraging policies favorable to Moscow, and weakening democratic governance. Putin's primary goal is maintaining power, and these activities also protect and grow the ill-gotten assets of his inner circle, defending their favored position and the wider patronage system. Russian corporations, oligarchs, and organized crime networks are all agents of malign influence abroad often acting on their own to curry favor with those in power, protect their standing, and guarantee future opportunities. Here's how. First, Russia enriches elites in target countries, including government officials, former political leaders, and other well-connected individuals in order to influence government's policies. Second, Russian entities provide direct support for Euroskeptic and liberal populist parties. Third, energy investments are used similarly to enrich elites, to fund political parties, and to create dependence in order to build leverage and impede leaders' ability to challenge Russia. Fourth, Russian proxies establish and finance a network of NGOs in Europe that support and connect Euroskeptic and pro-Kremlin movements. Fifth, Russia empowers fringe elements, including paramilitary groups, to increase polarization and hinder states' ability to govern. Finally, Russia uses dark money to support media outlets across Europe that spread favorable narratives. Russian online information operations, including by the infamous Internet Research Agency, often accompany these tactics, injecting disinformation and divisive content supporting the Kremlin's agenda. These tactics exploit weak regulatory enforcement, legal loopholes, enabling jurisdiction, erosion of the rule of law, and societal polarization. Vulnerabilities include weak penalties for money laundering, lacks foreign investment screening in Europe, and weak or absent laws on foreign funding of political candidates or parties, as well as the ability to form anonymous companies in the United States. The recent scandal in Austria, which the chairman discussed, highlights these vulnerabilities and how liberal forces in Europe embrace Russian support and facilitate its activities. As Dr. Carpenter noted, Chinese investments in Europe bring similar concerns over elite cultivation by entities with opaque ties to the party state, and Chinese and Russian activities can reinforce one another. And as you know, Russia has also used these tools to undermine democracy in the United States. The US government needs to develop a unified and integrated approach to this issue, including by creating a national hybrid threat center and appointing a counter foreign interference coordinator <laughs> at the National Security Council to coordinate U.S. government efforts. They also need to work closely with our allies across the Atlantic, including to facilitate a unified EU and NATO response. This is particularly essential as Putin seeks to divide us. We need to enhance coordination to share threat information and learn from one another's responses. NATO should continue to increase focus on non-traditional threats and enhance cooperation with the EU. The United States should also work with allies to articulate clear warnings about the consequences for unacceptable foreign interference. The United States should increase assistance programs to ensure partners and allies can withstand and respond to these tactics. We should continue working with European partners to reduce dependence on Russian energy 
and increase assistance to civil society, including investigative and independent media. The United States needs to do more to raise costs on Moscow by fully implementing existing sanctions as part of a comprehensive strategy with consistent messaging and coordination with European allies. Congress should consider additional sanctions, particularly in the financial sector, as well as automatic sanctions triggers if Russia engages in further interference operations. The United States should make clear that it will not tolerate enabling, indulging in, or importing Russia's corrupt and anti-democratic practice, practices, including by allies like Hungary. The United States should prioritize diplomatic efforts to convince countries of key concern to undertake reforms. We also need to enhance financial transparency. Congress should pass measures that require disclosure of beneficial ownership. Treasury's geographic targeting order program should be made permanent and nationwide. The United States should encourage the EU to develop a central anti-money laundering agency, fortify its new investment screening framework, and encourage stronger anti-money laundering enforcement and penalties. Finally, Putin and his cronies rely on the Western financial system to protect and grow their assets even while they seek to weaken us. This gives us leverage, and we should use it. We can do more to cut off access to our financial systems, including through targeted sanctions on Putin's cronies and implementation of the Global Magnitsky Act, and we need to do more to expose these activities. Russia's undermining of democracy demands a bipartisan response. The United States must recognize the threat and together with our European allies, act with the urgency and strength required. Thank you. Ms. Conley. Thank you, Chairman Keating, Ranking Member Kinziger, distinguished members of the committee. Using a variety of tools from corruption to influence operation, operations, the Kremlin undermines and weakens democracies, rendering them simply unable to respond promptly uh, to Russia's military actions or making them so beholden to the Kremlin that the country will actually support Russia's interests over its own. But the reason we study Russian tactics in Europe is to prevent them from working effectively here in the United States, or uh, hopefully preventing them to hap happening in Europe. I would like to offer a note of caution, however. We are prone to give a little too much weight and acknowledgement of the so-called brilliance of Russian malign influence operations. Sometimes they're just quite clumsy and amateurish, but they use all of their tools persistently and purposefully and they use all available means of influence. And this can be very overwhelming to us and to the American people. In other words, we simply don't connect our dots very well. So I just wanna give three framing points and then dive into two issues that I'm particularly concerned about as I look towards the 2020 US presidential election. Number one, the average American does not know that we are in a daily battle to preserve and protect the integrity of our democracy. We're at war, but this is a very different kind of war because the main battle space is a fight for the integrity of the American mind, and this is why it's so challenging. Russian malign influence is designed to alter how we think about ourselves and our democracy and to deepen our distrust as well as our disgust. It seeks to touch and shape every aspect of our lives, what we read, our personal preferences, and to make us doubt what we believe in. And it is designed to make us very, very angry at one another. And the third point is, it uses our weaknesses. That is Russia's strength, our weaknesses. So polarization and partisanship is our greatest weakness. And I'm so glad this committee continues to exhibit the leadership of bipartisanship. Polarization is evident in Europe today. We are also not structured to fight this battle. We are structured to fight terrorism and terrorism financing. We are not structured to fight malign influence and its many manifestations. So as we prepare for 2020, let me just offer two thoughts. I think we're increasingly going to see US voices and US organizations that will be the key disseminators of Russian malign disinformation with messages targeting vulnerable and divided U.S. communities. This is going to look a lot like domestic election campaign messaging, and it will likely be accompanied by hard-to-refute deep fake videos, audio, and image files. 
I am particularly concerned uh, about U.S. citizens and organizations wittingly or unwittingly becoming under the increasing threat of malign influence, faith-based and ultra-conservative organizations, and of course, opaque financial support of key U.S. Influence, influencers, which my colleagues have done a great job in explaining how that's such a powerful uh, part of Russia's toolkit. Just very briefly, over the last decade, the Kremlin has adopted a very compelling ideological narrative to mask its kleptocratic authoritarianism. Mixing pre-Soviet, Soviet, and Orthodox theologies, they have weaved together nationalism, patriotism, and faith. And Vladimir Putin and the Russian Orthodox Church are truly the embodiment of an anti-Western, anti-individualistic, xenophobic, and, and a great perversion of capitalism. They've taken this one step further, and they've linked Vladimir Putin's leadership to the biblical incarnation of the Third Rome, or the restoration of the Third Temple in Jerusalem. If you thought the Soviet Union was the godless communism, this is a very powerful messianic and mystical vision of its domestic and foreign policy that's furthered by the Orthodox Church. I've seen this work in Montenegro, in Serbia, in Bulgaria, I've seen it work across the board. It touches every aspect of people's lives. Their faith is an important part of their lives. But this is a source of concern to me as we have our own uh, challenges in separating ourselves in our faith-based views. Finally, in my few moments, and I'm sorry my voice is leaving me here, just to follow up on the uh, very impressive um, video of Mr. Heinz Christian Schrake, we did an entire case study on Austria in our most recent publication, The Kremlin Playbook II, The Enablers. This doesn't surprise me, and we can continue to articulate the problem. We have to start solving it. Congress has to pass ultimate beneficial ownership. We have to treat financial transparency and money laundering as the challenges to America's national security as they are. We can fight this. We can win this battle. We can go on the offensive, but we have to restore confidence in our own democracy first. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Duran. Uh, good morning, Chairman Keating and Ranking Member Kinzinger and members of the committee. Uh, I am Peter B. Duran, the CEO and President of the, Europe uh, the Center for European Policy Analysis, or CEPA. It is an honor to speak with you here today. I have already submitted my written testimony for the record, so I'd like to encapsulate it with one overall message for this committee. Right now, the Russian government believes that it is in a battle against the US-led economic and international order. The Russian government believes, believes it is winning this battle, and they are doubling down on their strategy to undermine Western democratic systems with tools of malign political influence. Based on the research and reporting at my organization, SIPA, I can confirm for this committee, the Russian government aims to attack Western political cohesion by using the very strengths of our liberal uh, democratic order against us. Russia has tried to subvert and allegedly topple, in one case, governments. It has peddled disinformation and called it free speech, and it has used corruption for political purposes under the cover of neutral business. These efforts are not isolated. Rather, they are the products of a coherent, unified strategy that was developed at the highest levels of the Russian government. Mr. Chairman, I am the co-author of a SIPA analytical report that I've submitted for the record. This report details how Russia seeks to weaken democracy by spreading chaos beyond its borders. Chaos is Russia's strategy. The Kremlin toolkit of financial corruption, disinformation, and influence operations are the means of activating that strategy. In doing so, Russia targets the things that make us strong. Pillars like the solidarity between our allies, the integrity of our political systems, and the unbeatable dynamism of our free market economies. I would stress for the committee that Russian leaders also exhibit a strong preference for deploying their malign toolkit in the energy arena. And when it comes to the corrupting combination of money and influence, I can think of no better example than Russia's Nord Stream 2 pipeline. This Congress is aware of that pipeline, 
It is the crown jewel of Russia's malign offensive in Europe. Vladimir Putin knows exactly what he's doing. He wants to Putinize us by normalizing corruption. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for sharing that visual aid at the start of this hearing uh, because it offers us an example of what uh, is taking place in Austria. Meanwhile, in Germany, I can confirm for the committee that the Nord Stream 2 pipeline is not just a commercial deal, as project promoters falsely claim. It will normalize a new, long-lasting, corrupting influence over our friends in Europe, especially our essential ally, Germany. So what do we do? How do we defeat Putin's strategy against us? Well, first, we need to understand that Russia's use of political corruption, disinformation, and malign influence has a purpose, to divide and weaken us. Second, the Russian government's strategy reveals to us what its leaders fear, the pillars of our power, especially when used in coordination with allies. Third, Vladimir Putin wins when our internal debates about Russia become polarized and partisan. As long as we are fighting each other, we are advancing the Kremlin's agenda. And fourth, U.S. and European policy must be dramatically reordered when it comes to the sequence of carrots and sticks we offer to the Kremlin. We need a lot more sticks and no consideration of carrots or open-ended partnership with Russia until we see undeniable signs that it has changed strategy. Let's not give carrots to those who would do us harm. When it comes to sticks, the costs we put upon Russia for deploying chaos against us must rise. I would agree with my co-witnesses here. Vladimir Putin needs to become more uncertain of our next move than we are of his. So what might costs look like? Well, let us finally show that we are serious. Let's finally put sanctions on Nord Stream 2. America can and should take this action today. Sanctions on Nord Stream 2 are the first, best, and most immediate way to show the Kremlin that we mean business. And when it comes to money, I would ask the committee to remember this. Russia's banks are just as dangerous as Russia's tanks. So let's also prepare effective mechanisms to prevent the buying and selling of Russian sovereign debt in our markets should Russia escalate against us in the future. Lastly, but perhaps most importantly, I would encourage this Congress to continue its essential support for this administration's commendable efforts to counteract Russian state-sponsored disinformation <laughs> and the fake news that the Kremlin injects into our Western body politic. This support is vital in counteracting Russia's strategy. Mr. Chairman, every strategy has a weakness, including chaos. The Kremlin's malign toolkit of chaos can be defeated. We just have to get a lot smarter about how we go about it. I thank you for the time, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Duran. Uh, Chair, I'll now recognize the ranking member for five minutes of questioning. Well, I, I thank the chairman, and again, I thank you all for being here. Uh, Ms. Conley, you mentioned, you know, the structure, and that's very correct, and I think an important point to note. You know, the United States needs to now go from, we remember in the Cold War, kind of a two-front war, to now basically two kinds of war, asymmetric and symmetric, and, you know, being able to prepare for the big fight, but also understanding we have to execute a fight against terrorism and also economically. So that's where I think some of that flexibility needs to come back. Just a small point of, of disagreement. You mentioned uh, ultra-conservative groups, and I wouldn't disagree with that, but I think there's also uh, groups on the left working on behalf of Vladimir Putin. Uh, you just look at Code Pink's occupation of the Venezuelan embassy to support a basically dictator that's a puppet of Vladimir Putin. So I think it's just important to point out that this is really all spectrums, and Russia uses all tools. Uh, Mr. Doran, I want to ask you uh, how the Russian tactics are evolving. You know, we've broadly grasped the existing hybrid warfare toolkit, but what do we expect in the next generation of tactics? Thank you, Ranking Member. I would say this. When we look at the elements of Russian malign influence, I think you are absolutely correct to ask, 
the evolution question. Uh, oftentimes at SEPA, we think about these techniques as a virus. In order to understand a virus, you have to first understand uh, how it evolves and mutates what you're dealing with. Uh, where I would stress for this committee to pay most attention to is the way in which Russia can compete against us for pennies on the dollar. Every single effort we put to counter them uh, costs us more money than they uh, require to attack us. So on steps of evolving, Russia is limited only by the creativity of the GRU and some of their malign actors in Europe. Uh, I wouldn't begin to uh, speculate as to how a virus would evolve as much as I would about how Russia can evolve. What I can say is that we need to stop playing whack-a-mole with the Kremlin, and we need to raise the costs on Vladimir Putin so he does not deploy these techniques against us in the first place. Thank you. I think that builds into the idea of, uh, I mean, look back, we hate this term, mutual assured destruction and the nuclear side was not a good thing. Uh, but I think we need to make it clear to the Russians that we can do to you what you can do to us. That raises the cost on them. Vladimir Putin fears nothing more than losing his grip on power. And I think we ought to threaten that uh, that way. So I also want to ask the whole panel, Russia's use of armed mercenary groups like the Wagner Group to secure their interest and support brutal dictators like Assad and Maduro is another example of their low-cost, high-reward strategy to hinder our interests. Our military has shown that we will respond to Russian aggressions from these groups when provoked, as we did when we quickly obliterated a regiment of the Wagner Group in Syria. However, the sanctions we have on officials connected with the group have not stopped their recent deployment to Venezuela and several sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, I'll start with you, Mr. Dorn. We can ask the whole panel, what would you suggest in terms of a more effective response against Russia's use of paramilitary groups like Wagner? Thank you, Ranking Member. I would underscore my, my first position that we need to dramatically raise the financial costs on the Kremlin should we decide that they have escalated. If we determine as a country that Russia is using its uh, paramilitary forces against us, I think the uh, ending of the buying and selling of Russian sovereign debt in our markets is a good first step, and I know that is a question before this Congress. Anybody else? Um, Congressman, I, I would argue we, we must uh, make a declarative policy that the Wagner Group we recognize as a branch of the Russian military and treat it uh, as, a, as a hostile action. What's making Wagner so effective is that Vladimir Putin can immediately send those forces. To, he can achieve his political objective with military means. He's not threatening it. He's doing it and stopping the U.S. He's stopping any advancement of, of the U.S. and its objectives. And then we have to confront whether it's worth lives to fight that, and that's what he's banking on. We have to make the costs greater. We have to, Russia right now is so extended in Syria and Central African Republic within Venezuela, we have to make that, squeeze those costs and make them greater. They're going to expend themselves, then, then we have to make that as painful as possible. But we also have to get our policy house in order and have clear policies with allies that can be more anticipatory rather than simply responding to Russia's quicker act. And I noticed he got pretty quiet after the Syria incident, Ms. Rosenberg. Yeah, I was just going to add, I agree with, uh, with Heather that uh, we need to recognize the role that Wagner is playing vis-a-vis -vis the Russian government. I'd also note, though, that the key f suspected financier and one of the key founders of, uh, of the Wagner Group are actually both under U.S. sanctions already. But what I think we need to do is look at how Wagner operates. It actually seems to operate based on resource contracts. So if we look in Syria, reports have indicated that Prigozhin and the Syrian government maintain a contract to grant Prigozhin a cut of profits from oil fields take it, retaken by Wagner. In Sudan, the group is reportedly providing security for gold mines. The group is also reportedly acting as personal security and as military trainers in Africa. So it speaks to the systemic nature, again, of the entire, in, the entire financial ecosystem and the corrupt nature that, the, that groups like Wagner are able to exploit in order to get these kickbacks. Thank you, Dr. Carpenter. No offense, but I'm out of time, so I'll, I'll skip you if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you. The chair will now recognize himself for uh, five minutes. I just want to deal with something specific, if I can. Hungary recently allowed a small Russian bank, the International Investment Bank, to open their new headquarters in Budapest. One of the chairmen of the bank has a longstanding tie with Russian intelligence agencies. What are the risks of this bank being headquartered in an EU and NATO member state, number one? Number two, what can the United States and the EU do to respond to decisions by EU member states? Or 
non-EU members for that matter, to increase the, the, these actions that increase the vulnerability in our overall financial systems. Thirdly, what tools do we have at our disposal, whether the U.S. alone or with allies, what tools do we have to eliminate or lessen these vulnerabilities? Uh, I'd like to just uh, jump ball, whoever wants to go for us. Dr. Sure. Carpenter. I, I'm happy to start, uh, Chairman. I, I think this is uh, a huge vulnerability for uh, not just Hungary, but for the entire EU, because it's a potential tro Trojan horse for Russian money laundering and covert influence. So what can we do? Well, a number of things. A European-wide anti-money laundering institution is probably the most important step that the Europeans themselves could take uh, to regulate these, this, sorts of, this sort of behavior um, and then investigate uh, financial institutions like this one that emerge uh, in their jurisdiction. For us, we need to push back on Hungary more than we have been so far. Hungary has become a mini version of Russia. It is a kleptocratic and increasingly authoritarian system, and we have, because it is an ally, because it is important, and it is, uh, we have refrained from criticizing and from exerting leverage over Budapest. I think that's a mistake. So I think on the geopolitical front, we need to apply pressure on Hungary at the same time as we pursue some of these broader systemic uh, uh, solutions to money laundering and covert influence. I would firmly endorse the need for creation of an EU-wide anti-money laundering mechanism. Right now, we have a gap between the um, the uh, the European-wide um, financial system and the national level regulatory bodies, and so we don't. There is a mismatch in between the the regulatory system, and that needs to be urgently addressed. And again, I would completely endorse the need to push back much harder on, on Prime Minister Orban. I think the kind of treatment that he received here in the U.S. last week exactly undercuts what we need to be doing and the message we need to be sending. So, Chairman, the IIB and, and the fact that the Hungarian government gave the IIB diplomatic immunity is a U.S., NATO, and EU policy failure. Um, I, it's, it's quite interesting that even Mr. Straka mentions in the video about following Orban, Orbanism, and, and the playbook that Mr. Orban has created. I, I think it's time to now contemplate sanctioning uh, select Hungarian officials. I think it's time to contemplate, as much as it grieves me, to limit Hungary's access to NATO classified information. I think the, um, I think the risk now has become so great uh, that we have to contemplate measures that would just be the last thing I would wish to contemplate. But if we do not get serious about this, all it does is grow the problem. Uh, the Hungarian government has been warned by members of Congress and the Senate about this, and it goes absolutely unheeded. We have well, to take action. Well, the we that we're talking about I think is important, and I just want to drill down on NATO as a whole. You know, we all are aware uh, of the enormous information sharing that's going on in regards to security and terrorist threats that exist with our uh, NATO allies. Uh, it's extraordinary, it's strong, it remains strong, yet we're not breaching this area of attack at all in terms of uh, what our defenses could be. We're not, we're not discussing it. So what can NATO do together? This to me, it seems critical. What can NATO do together to, to deal with this? Ms. Rosenberg. I think it's a really cr critical question. So NATO has done more to look at non-traditional threats um, as part of its mandate, but I think it needs to go further. Number one, I think it needs to strengthen cooperation with the EU, including on intelligence sharing. Number two, I think that NATO needs to re-emphasize what, uh, this is um, a, an idea proposed by former U.S. Ambassador to NATO, um, General Doug Lute, um, needs to re-emphasize Article 3, which is about resilience. It's about every member of the alliance actually having the resilience to withstand and provide for the kind of defense needed. And so many of the tactics that we see the Kremlin using are actually targeting these internal vulnerabilities. So resilience has to be a key part of the strategy. Finally, I think the hybrid threat center that the EU and NATO have set up in Helsinki needs to do more to prioritize the kinds of tools and tactics that we're talking about today. It's doing great work on information operations and cyber attacks, but energy and economic coercion is part of its mandate and it needs to take a higher priority on that. Thank you, I, I, I agree fully. Uh, we can't do this alone since we reversed order uh, uh, of the opening questions. We'll uh, go, now go to uh, Representative Albio Sirius, who chairs the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee and the Foreign Affairs Committee. Mr. Sirius. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here. You know, all my life I keep saying this, while we sleep, the Russians plot how to hurt us. And I've spent most of my life trying to wake people up and say, hey, let's stop paying attention. You know, now they're playing in the Western Hemisphere. Look what is happening in Venezuela. If you look at Nicaragua, they sold Nicaragua 50 tanks last year, $80 million. I mean, that's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. They're playing in some of the other countries. Where do you now, also, we also have in the Western Hemisphere, the Chinese. Do you see any coordination between the Chinese and the Russians in the Western Hemisphere to destabilize some of these places? Dr. Carpenter? So I would say in terms of overt coordination, I don't think we have evidence of that, but we clearly see uh, mutually aligned interests in terms of supporting dictators like Maduro. Um, uh, also, the same thing happens in Syria. In Europe, we see, for example, malign influence channels where the Chinese piggyback on Russian malign influence networks and vice versa. Um, the closest example to sort of coordination against a, a, a democratic state is, uh, I believe in June of 2017, there was a series of coordinated cyber attacks against the South Korean government uh, that were originating from Russia and China at the same time. Uh, it's circumstantial evidence as to whether that was coordinated or just, ha again, they happen to have the same target. But clearly their, their interests align in terms of propping up teetering authoritarians and then also undermining democratic regimes whenever they can. Congressman, I think what we're seeing across the board is Russia trying to re-enliven its uh, former Soviet relationships, through, certainly through arms exports. We're seeing that across the board, Middle East, Africa, um, as well as some of its uh, economic uh, contexts. This is an area of understanding Chinese and Russian interaction, which is an area of research that we all, I think, have to do a much better job. I would observe they're staying out of each other's way to an extent, but uh, they're, what they're trying to do is prevent any change of regime. This is what frightens both Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin the most. It's uh, their own internal unrest unseating them someday. So this is all about regime status quo, and they will do what they need to do economically or militarily to try to preserve regime status quo wherever it, it may be. And certainly where it's important to the United States, that is even a higher priority. Anybody else? I would agree um, that I don't think we've seen enough evidence yet of overt coordination. But I do think, um, number one, there is the alignment of interests. I do think it's important to understand that China and Russia have different long-term games. So whereas chaos and disruption is the goal of the of most of the Kremlin's activities, um, you know, that's in part driven by the fact that Russia is an objectively declining power. Um, I think that Heather was absolutely right to emphasize we can't give Putin um, and his cronies more credit than they're due. Um, this is largely a disruption strategy, and that's relatively easy. Um, what Beijing is trying to do is actually a much longer term, more strategic, and therefore, I think, even more um, nefarious game. It's harder to detect. China is actually trying to not just weaken the international order in the short term, but to construct something alternative in the long term. And that means that they are more careful. They don't want to be caught. Putin often wants to be caught. Um, and I think that that has different implications for the policy response. Nonetheless, I completely agree with what Dr. Carpenter said. The Chinese often piggyback on the Russians' tactics. And I think that's something for us to be very aware of. Do you see the rise of the uh, right wing and populist parties uh, in some of these countries as a result of Russia's effort? I'm sorry, Congressman, can you repeat that just at the very end? I didn't know. You, you have the rise of all these right wing, all these extremists in some of these countries. Do you see the rise in that as a result of Russia's hand in, in, in some of these countries? So again, I would say the weakness exists already in this society. Many of these groups a decade ago would have been polling at one or two percent. The economic crisis, the global economic crisis, uh, fueled great uncertainty. The migration crisis in Europe fueled it even more. So these groups where Russia had made some long-term investments in funding them and encouraging them because they were against the European Union, they were against the United States, 
these parties now, because of the conditions, have grown and Russia is amplifying their message. So it is not the Russians that are causing this, it is because of the internal dimensions in European societies, but Russia is amplifying it, helping those messages, helping to, uh, to instill more division in the society, and this is the creation of the chaos, the disruption, anything to make the West look bad, because the last thing President Putin wants is the Russian people to want what the West has, because he can never give that to them, him, give that to them and remain in power. So he has to make the West look the absolutely worst. And so he's just showing how horrible it is, how divided it is, how decadent it is, and then the Russian people will never want the West. Thank you, my time is up. If I could just add to that, um, I think there, it, there's a pattern of evidence that shows that Russia is financially and also through other means supporting right-wing groups, especially across Europe. So if you look at the Jobbik far-right party in Hungary, if you look at a tiny little pro-Russian party in Poland called Zmiana, was funded through laundered money that went through the Russian laundromat that was funneled through banks in Moldova, ended up in Zmiana's coffers as a means of supporting this little fringe party, but on the right, to, to throw chaos again into the Polish political system. And we see this across the board, the video of Strache and what's happened in Austria recently, also indicative. So Russia bets on many horses, but they look to the far right as one of the most disruptive elements in European politics. Thank you. Representative Greg Pence from Indiana. Thank you, Chairman Keating and Ranking Member uh, Kinzinger. Uh, I'm going to actually ask uh, a follow-up question to Congressman Cirrus, but I'm going to get there a little bit in a, in a different sort of way. Uh, on May 9th, Chairman Keating and Ranking Member Kinzinger held a meeting on China's expanding influence in Europe and Asia, Eurasia. The witnesses laid out in detail how China, through the Belt and Road Initiative and their use of state-owned enterprises, undermine U.S. interests and those of our European allies and partners. As a member of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, we even spoke about Chinese SOEs and BDYs specifically in the context of our domestic infrastructure work just two weeks ago. But China isn't alone in these types of activities, as, as we're talking about today, Russia's right there with them. This theme of Russian and Chinese convergent in Europe was my biggest and most concerning takeaway from our previous hearings. Ms. Rosenberger, you address Russian ownership of assets in Europe states in your prepared testimony when you cite your fellow witness, Ms. Connolly, saying, quote, a strategic level, at, a, at a strategic level, level, Heather Connolly found in CSIS's Kremlin playbook that countries where Russia's economic footprint was greater than 12 percent of GDP were valuable to Russian influence and state capture. Here's my two questions as a takeoff. One, have Russian Chinese found new ways to invest in countries' infrastructure to continue to hurt U.S. allies like private corporations? And two, to what degree are we observing Russian Chinese cooperation in these private, coercive economic tactics. Start with you, Dr. Carpenter. So again, uh, Congressman, I would say we have seen a certain degree of perhaps tacit coordination when the Chinese uh, government was looking at investing in the port of Piraeus in Greece, one of the biggest ports in the world. Uh, the Russians were also very much interested in this as an infrastructure project. I think the key for the Russians was to ensure that Piraeus was, uh, was not bought by Western, especially American investors, and so they were happy to see the, the Chinese uh, move in there. And then since, of course, there's been a huge tax evasion scandal that has surfaced as a result of uh, Chinese goods flowing through that port. And, and you're referring to private investment Correct. in China well, and Russia. Well, investment by, by Chinese state-owned companies. So, uh, sort of peristatals, if you will. Uh, we see competition now as U.S. investors are poised to develop the Anaklia Deepwater Port uh, in, on the Black Sea coast of Georgia. Again, this interferes with the Chinese One Belt, One Road initiative. They would like to be uh, involved there. The Russians are also not happy about this investment. So, their, their interests often align. Uh, and then we see sometimes t tacit coordination, but again, nothing overt at this stage. Thank you, sir. I think it's a really important question. 
Um, I would caution uh, personally that I don't believe there is such a thing as a private Chinese company that is engaged in overseas investment. Um, there are different kinds of arrangements. Some of them are state-owned. Some of them have different kinds of relationships with the party state. But I certainly don't believe, um, as somebody who has spent a good bit of my career on China, that there is such a thing of a private Chinese company that has the ability to engage in foreign investment and foreign trade activity. Much of what we see through the Belt and Road Initiative is the use of um, market distorting tactics in order to help uh, provide for or facilitate foreign investment in, uh, in targeted states. This then provides a, a uh, distortion in the market for other firms that are trying to compete um, so that the uh, Chinese firms gain a foothold. They then are able to create dependencies. That creates leverage things like the debt trap, which I know you heard about in your hearing last week. Um, these are all a, a, an ecosystem that becomes created that gives the Chinese Communist Party and its proxies a foothold in these countries. Um, in my testimony, I spoke sp specifically about an example from the Czech Republic, where a company called CEFC China Energy had done a lot to, uh, to cultivate um, Czech President Zeman and create potentially some connectivity similar to what we see Russia doing. Um, so I think it is really important to understand the very holistic strategy and the way that it is, in fact, targeting our European allies. Last point, I was in Brussels last week. I got off the plane, was heading through customs, and the very first thing I saw was an electronic billboard that was advertising for Huawei. Vote Huawei 5G. It's our values. It's our values. So I am particularly concerned not just about the broader strategy, not just about the dependency created, but the dependencies that are going to be created through investment in the technology sector. These are going to be transformative kinds of investments that will affect not only our economies, but our strategic interests in the decades to come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Thank you. Representative Dina Titus from Nevada. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing. You know, the Mueller report concluded that uh, the Russian government had interfered in our election. I think the quote was in a sweeping and systematic fashion. And you all, in your very expert ways, have laid out a number of examples of Russian interference in Europe from Greece to Lithuania. Yet we have a president who seems to just poo-poo all this. He, uh, he sides with Putin over our own intelligence. He says he believes Putin when he didn't say, when he tells him he didn't do it or he doesn't bother to ask about the 2020 elections. Uh, he just uh, minimizes at every turn this Russian engagement. He seems to think that Russia could be a buddy of ours if we just find the right interest. Now, that's totally contrary to a lot of scholars who have said that, and I think you just mentioned it earlier, Putin needs the U.S. as an enemy uh, in order to maintain his position at home. So my first question would be to you, where do you fall? Do you think that that's an accurate description, or do you think we can just kind of work out a few of the details and then be friends with Russia down the road? And then the second part of the question is you have laid out for us the things we need to do, stronger sanctions, campaign finance reform, cracking down on LLCs, money laundering. But I would ask you, isn't all of that undermined by the president's position, by his attack on the free press, uh, turning them into the enemy when they could be a good anecdote to, uh, to this sort of activity with the real fake news coming out of Russia, the lack of the State Department doing anything kind of that parallels the EU's action plan against disinformation, and also just his general antipathy towards multilateral arrangements. So we aren't working with our allies in Europe. So one, how do you feel about Russia being a buddy? And second, do you think all these suggestions that you make are being undermined by what's coming out of the White House? Doctor, you start. Happy to start, uh, Congresswoman. I, I think there is this myth that we have uh, a range of potentially cooperative interests with Russia, when in fact Russia's primary interest is to undermine U.S. democracy. They see their role, for example, in Syria as undermining our ability to create regime change, a political transition, if you will, in Syria. The, the scope for cooperation is minimal to nil there and across the board, whether it's CT, whether it's um, uh, in any other sphere, other than potentially in arms control with the extension of the New START Treaty. That's about the only 
potential overlapping interests that I can see. Everywhere else, Russia's primary goal is to undermine us. Now, in terms of your second question, I completely agree. What, what Putin, the, the narrative that Russia is pushing here is precisely a narrative you can't trust the media. The media are, are biased. You know, so when the president says things, calls the media the enemy of the people, he is playing into Putin's narrative. That is exactly what Russia wants. And that's why Russia also cultivates various populist politicians across Europe, because they, they advance that very same narrative of undermining democratic institutions and trust in them law enforcement, tax authorities, all of this. It is, it is not just the Putin playbook, it's the Orban playbook. And then when we see it happening here in this country, absolutely, this undermines our ability to build resilience against these subversive tactics. Thank you. I just agree that I think we need to be very clear-eyed on what Putin's strategy is and how that does not, in fact, line up with an attempt to uh, be friendly. But on, the, um, on your question about um, uh, whether or not uh, some of these suggestions can exist without a broader strategy. I would say um, they can certainly be a little bit of a patchwork, and I think that's what we see cropping up right now um, by a lot of dedicated folks in government who are trying to do the right thing. But this is a whole of society problem. Many of the challenges that we're talking about today by their asymmetric and evolving nature fall in gaps and seams of our government. It requires an integrated, coordinated, and holistic approach that requires leadership from the top, strategic messaging, and I think we need to take some very clear steps in order to make that possible. Congresswoman, um, uh, Mr. Putin needs the conflict with the West. That is his entire uh, point of survival. He, there can be no Russia without Mr. Putin, and he will protect that from the West. Unfortunately, what Mr. Putin needs to protect Russia from is from China and China's growing um, encirclement of, of Russia. I, I think exactly to Laura's point, every one of the departments and agencies are doing their best to do their best. We just do not have a focused White House bipartisan priority on this very important task. And the last thing I will say is even when President Trump does uh, meet with Mr. Putin and he has expressions of strong support, what happens is that there's a real reaction against that. There's an antibody. Congress passes more powerful sanctions. There's an outcry. So even when the president takes positions that seem very much at odds with where our policy is, where our national interests are, there is a reaction against what that is. And I think that demonstrates we are very uncomfortable when President Putin is very pleased with something the U.S. does. We know instinctively that that works against the United States. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Representative Ron Wright of Texas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Conley, I want to go back to energy policy for a moment. And uh, Mr. Duran, I'd like for you to also comment, giving your earlier comment about Nordstrom too. It has to do with Russia weaponizing its energy resources against European <laughs> countries. Uh, Earlier this year, uh, we passed Mr. Kissinger's uh, European Energy Security and Diversi Diversification Act, Let's see if I can get that word out, uh, which provides support to European countries to diversify its energy resources. Tomorrow, we're going to consider my bill, the Energy Diplomacy Act, which will authorize an Assistant Secretary of State for Energy Resources within the State Department. Uh, dedicated to uh, advancing our energy um, security interests and those of our allies. Apart from those things, what would you recommend that we do, Congress do, to help countries in their dependence on Russian oil and gas, and particularly in Europe? Thank you, Congressman. Um, I think your question is perfectly phrased and, and well-timed. Uh, I would say this because we've heard a lot about perhaps the vacuum that has been created in the past in Europe and a lot of questions about what the United States does about it on energy or diplomacy. And I think the merger of those two things is important. First and foremost, I think it is essential that we offer free market alternatives to Russia's monopolistic forms of competition in the energy space in Europe. Uh, as I said uh, earlier, that means uh, sanctions on Nord Stream 2 while simultaneously providing 
market-based alternatives through U.S. LNG and other sources. Uh, I think the United States can and should take a greater leadership role in rallying our European allies in Europe to create a, what I would call a shield wall against Nord Stream 2. I would stress this for the committee. Many European allies look to Germany as a weather vane for what is and is not acceptable when it comes to their relations with Russia. We've heard a lot of testimony this morning about how this ally or that has been too cozy with the Russians. But I would stress, Europeans look at what Germany is doing as a signal for how, what is acceptable in their relations with Russia. The United States can and should pre, uh, use its bully pulpit and its leadership to say there is an alternative, it's free market based, the Russians are not your friends, we need to slam the door on their energy uh, competition, uh, monopolistic competition in Europe. Um, Congressman, we've documented both in the Kremlin Playbook 1 and the Kremlin Playbook 2 that energy is a key source of Russian malign influence. It's sort of the joke of why did the robber rob the bank? Well, that was, that's where the money is. That is where Russia's source of power and its money is. So the Bulgarian case, which Congressman Pence had, had mentioned about this, this threshold that we saw of Russia's economic footprint in a given country, Bulgaria has been unable to, uh, and unwilling to diversify its own energy, which is crazy. It pays some of the, the highest uh, costs of, of Russian uh, oil and gas, and it's one of the closest neighbors to Russia. It cannot diversify. There are so many influential tools of you know, fictitious NGOs that come up, or it has influencers with the government. It refuses to diversify. Now, yes, the United States can certainly uh, provide alternatives. U.S. LNG is a perfect example. It almost overnight, when Lithuania imported U.S. LNG, it dropped Gazprom's price by 30. So we need competition, absolutely. But we need transparency into how Russia is using its energy leverage in Bulgaria, in Hungary. We need to be as concerned about Nord Stream 2 as we are about Turk Stream, which is going to do the exact same thing that South Stream, which, which thankfully ended due to a lot of American leadership and European leadership, but it's coming back again. So we have to work with our European partners. The challenge that we have is we need to keep uh, our allies in a strong position our, whatever policy response can't weaken our allies, it has to strengthen them. So I would recommend doing a much more of a deeper dive financially into the banks that are supporting Nord Stream 2, the energy companies. If they were to completely be transparent about the nature of their transactions, we may have a different view. It may be a different tool than sanctioning them, which is, I understand, uh, certainly uh, under contemplation. But we have different tools, and transparency is one of the biggest. Thank you very much. I'm out of time. Representative David Cicilline from Rhode Island. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses for your testimony. Uh, Dr. Carpenter, I, I want to focus for a moment on the, the dark money that is supporting political candidates. Uh, as you know, the Russians have provided funds through illicit means directly to pro-Russian political parties and individuals. Uh, as an example, an obscure Russian bank provided the French political party National Rally with a multi-million dollar loan before the last French presidential election. That's just one example. I wonder if you could just tell us what your sense is of the magnitude of this problem, of how pervasive this kind of dark money is, and whether the existing European governments have the tools at their disposal because of existing laws uh, to prevent that. Is, can the US be doing more to support that work? Should we be working more closely with them, and, and how should we be doing that? Because it seems to me if those resources remain available, that becomes a very substantial source of Russian maligned activity when they have the ability to prop up and even help be successful certain candidates. Thank you, Congressman, for the question. I, I think this is crucial. This gets at the heart of Russia's influence operations is how it finances them via dark money. And we really don't know how much of this money flows into Europe or into our own system. In 2015, the Treasury Department estimated that some $300 billion is laundered annually into the United States, but that's from a variety of different sources. Now, other estimates have said that Russian private holdings abroad are between $800 billion and about $1.3 trillion. So there's a vast amount of resources that are held by 
oligarchs, tycoons, businessmen, uh, Russian companies that is available for use in dark money operations and influence operations. We don't know, the, the bottom line is we don't know the extent of it, but what we have to do is empower the Europeans uh, to go after uh, anti, with anti-money laundering regulations and with a regulator uh, that exists across the EU, and we ourselves need, desperately need to address the issue of shell companies and beneficial ownership, exposing that ownership so that we have more transparency about what the Russians are doing in our own country. It is so easy to establish layer upon layer of shell companies through Delaware, Nevada, North Dakota, other states, um, and then to, to siphon money into our political process. It's just simply all too easy, and we don't know the extent of the dark money that flows through that process. And in addition to that, I know there's been some effort, um, most recently by the French, but I know other European countries have, uh, have engaged in some effort to reduce the dissemination of fake news or fake information on social media and really hold uh, service providers accountable. And I don't know whether any of those, if there's enough information to determine whether those have been successful. Are there lessons we can learn about their effort? And this is for any of the witnesses to respond to this other substantial source of power in these elections, that is the misuse and wide dissemination of uh, inaccurate and, and false information. Thank you. Yeah, I think the EU is actually really leading in this space um, and is leading in a way that, frankly, the United States has not been. Um, I think there are a number of steps that the um, EU and its various institutions have taken um, that are worth considering. Um, one is it has created a rapid alert system amongst its uh, member states, particularly in advance of the parliament elections, that is sharing real-time information amongst the, among the different states about what they are seeing in their information ecosystem so that they can alert one another to possible trends. Two, um, they have taken on this code of practice that is a sort of self-regulatory agreement with the platforms. Um, some of the platforms have signed up, not all of them have, um, but it is an interesting model that is then actually giving some accountability and transparency to what the platforms are doing. They are required to provide monthly reports to um, various parts of the EU in advance of the parliament elections and hopefully <coughs> continuing beyond that. The one thing I would caution about what we are seeing in terms of a number of the proposals coming out of Europe and other parts of the world dealing with information operations and information manipulation is a focus on content. And I have argued uh, that, in fact, what we see engaging in certainly the Russian-style information operations is not properly seen as a content problem. It's a problem of, um, of bad actors, nefarious actors, and manipulative behavior. Most of the content that we've actually seen pushed by the internet research agency and similar outfits is not actually information that is demonstrably true or not. It is engaged in manipulation, polarization, and other kinds of operation under false pretenses. So I would caution about going down that road. If I could add just one last point as well on your prior question, I would just like to note you asked about laws on foreign financing. And actually, uh, we did a survey of the legal frameworks in EU member states um, with regard to foreign financing. And in fact, only half of EU member states have a complete ban on foreign financing of political parties or candidates. So while the dark money problem is a huge issue, in a number of states there are either major loopholes or no prohibition whatsoever. So we actually have a problem as well of just inviting the Russians in through the front door. Thank you so much. My time is expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Representative Michael Guest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to talk about one specific uh, portion of a Russian foreign policy, which is their Arctic strategy. Uh, we've seen increased uh, Russian military footprint in the Arctic. Uh, media outlets have reported that in recent years, Russia has unveiled a new Arctic command, four new Arctic brigade combat teams, 14 new operational airfields, 16 deep water ports, and 40 icebreakers with an additional 11 in development. So we see increased military bases, increased military ports, a dominant icebreaker fleet when compared to America, 40 to 2. Uh, other media reports have said that Russia has deployed the S-400 surface-to-air missile as well as the Bastan anti-ship missile. Uh, and so my question is, in light of this increased military buildup, and this is going to be to the entire panel, so I'll start with you, Dr. Carpenter. Uh, one, I would ask you to speak to the importance of the Arctic strategy to Russia's overall global policy, uh, and then two, what should be done to combat Russia's growing military presence in the Arctic? 
Thank you for the question, Congressman. This is um, an area of the world that Russia is uh, rapidly militarizing uh, with each year. There are more, as you say, airfields, more military capabilities put into the Arctic in order for Russia to be able to dominate the northern sea route uh, and the transit of commerce uh, through that region, as well as to ensure the, that the Russians have a leg up in terms of developing hydrocarbon and other mineral resources uh, beneath the uh, Arctic uh, seabed. So this is an area that we have, frankly, lagged. Uh, you mentioned the icebreaker fleet comparison. We have two is actually a, a, a generous guess. It's more like one and a half, depending on when that other uh, breaker is able to operate. Uh, and the Russians are just, you know, they're, they're miles ahead of us. So we need, you know, we've had this mantra of we don't want to militarize the Arctic. But the reality is that Russia is militarizing, and so we have to respond, uh, not necessarily about putting in place offensive capabilities, but we need to uh, ensure freedom of navigation. We've been ra actually rather reticent to push that in the Pentagon, and I feel that we should be doing a lot more of that to assert our, 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 our rights in those uh, northern sea passages, uh, because Russia has a long-term strategy, and they're banking on it, and the Chinese are looking very enviously also at what Russia is doing, and we're, the, we're caught behind. I just underscore the strategic importance of the Arctic, and as Dr. Carpenter ended up there at the end, um, China has also been well ahead of us in terms of the way that it is using and exploiting uh, the, the various resources and the strategic passageways there, so it's of incredible importance. But I'm going to let Ms. Conley jump in on this because she's the true expert here on this issue. Well, Congressman, thank you uh, for the question. Um, again, sort of rethinking how important the Arctic is the, to Stalin, the Red Arctic. This was about uh, you know, man defeating nature. It's very much about heroism uh, in, the, in the Russian mindset. It's the Russian Orthodox Church. So we've had Orthodox priests sprinkling holy water on the North Pole. I mean, there's lots of myth making about it, but they understand it's about st it's strategy, strategy, and strategic location, getting to the North Atlantic and the North Pacific very, very quickly. Uh, we've done some analysis of commercial satellite imagery of Wrangell Island, which is 300 nautical miles from Alaska, which we are seeing a very sophisticated Sopka 2 radar. Uh, we are also noticing uh, with increased uh, interest a whole new set of weaponry that the Russians will test in an exercise this September in Tensir. We need to pay attention to this. Um, I, I think um, your colleagues in the Senate Armed Service Committee certainly understand it, but no one has the resources. No one wants to put the resources. We don't need 40 icebreakers. We don't have the Arctic coastline, but we need sufficient presence, both air, land, and maritime, to be able to ensure we have access to the Arctic. That's freedom of navigation, that's over the air, and to make sure that Mr. Putin, as he just said in April uh, in St. Petersburg at his annual Territory of Dialogues, we, he is suggesting that we don't want the Arctic to turn into another Crimea. Of course we don't. But we need to make sure that NATO and the United States um, are positioned to make sure that Mr. Putin does not even contemplate thinking about the Arctic as a place to disrupt or destabilize. We both want mutual peace, security, and collaboration. But you're asking the right questions, and you also have to look at Chinese and Russian interaction in the Arctic, which is uh, China right now is constructing two ports in the Russian Arctic, the Port of Sabeta and the Archangelsk port. We've, their energy inter interests are intertwining, and we're going to see a lot of Chinese LNG car uh, carriers going through the Bering Strait. We're not prepared for that future either. Congressman, can I just jump in here really fast with one final point, which I think is crucial for this committee to remember. Uh, right now, we are in a state of competition with China and Russia. You, we've heard a lot about that today, but if in a sporting competition you're losing 40 to 2, there's no way to spin it, you're losing. When we look at our competition in the high north, I would encourage the committee to remember the essential element of our allies. Countries like Norway are power generators for the United States. They're power projectors for the United States. We can do a lot more to rely upon our essential allies, such as Norway and others, uh, to listen and be more active in the high north. Something to remember. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Representative Tim Burchett from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess this is for, um, I guess, um, Mr. Duran or, or Ms. Rosenberger, if that's okay. And if anybody else wants to jump in, just jump in. 
Um, in your all's views, what's the most vulnerable European states to Russian disinformation campaigns? And do you project, uh, project to be the, who do you project to be the next electoral target? And if y'all hesitate, it takes up all my time, and it makes me, <laughs> it makes me look very intelligent, question. so just hesitate a well, little well, bit. Well, no, 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 no. So let me, let me start with the, with the end of it, which you asked, which is most likely to be the next electoral target. I would argue it's all of them, and I would argue that we can't see election interference as a discrete thing in and of itself. The strategies that all of us talked about today, these tactics, these are ongoing operations, and elections are one moment in time. One of my colleagues has said, in fact, that election interference or elections are not necessarily the beginning point or the end point of interference operations. They are the flashpoint. It is a moment of opportunity for Putin to gain particular strategic gains and where you have a broader target surface. <coughs> but most of those operations are going on for quite some time and continue for quite some time afterwards. So that's point one. In terms of who's most vulnerable, it's an incredibly difficult question, hence the hesitation. Um, I would simply say that I think what we have seen is countries that are most vulnerable are those where polarization is high, where independent media has been, where the space has been shrunk, um, and where you have, um, uh, where you don't have credible voices who are giving uh, people a, a sense of, um, of a shared fact base. And so I think that those are three vulnerabilities that I would look at when trying to understand who, which countries may in fact be most vulnerable. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, rather than saying one specific country, because I think there's more than one, I will give you a region to look at, the Western Balkans. And that applies not just to Russian disinformation, but also China. There was questions earlier about uh, the purchasing of, by Chinese companies <laughs> in Europe and which, what industry should be, we be afraid of. When it comes to both Russia and China in the Western Balkans and elsewhere, I would encourage the committee to look at the media industry. It is easy to purchase radio stations, television stations, and other segments of the media to, and change their editorial policies to say, Chinese policy in Europe is good, Russian policy is good. So I would encourage that focus. Uh, Western Balkans, that's a key. Would you encourage us to get into the media business? I don't think it ma makes much sense for Congress to start its own television station. I think your C-SPAN uh, ratings are kind of <laughs> low these days. Yeah, I know. We'd have to do um, reruns of Finding Bigfoot. I've always found that does better than the national news. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. If I could just piggyback on that last point, though, what I think we can do much more of is supporting investigative journalists across the region. They are vulnerable uh, in the Western Balkans, as Peter has rightly pointed out, where there is a soft target for Russian disinformation. But they're vulnerable across the board. There was a Slovak journalist who was murdered uh, last year. There was a Ukrainian journalist, uh, Katarina Hanzuk, who was doused with a fatal dose of acid. Uh, she died later. Uh, across the region, they are under fire, uh, and they need uh, both a network of support, but also the resources to be able to withstand these attacks from often entrenched corrupt actors in these societies, and usually backed by Russia and China. Yes. I, I would just offer, I think one country that probably not uh, in our uh, focus for vulnerability is actually Germany, which will be having three Lander elections in the fall in the east. It's a political transition that is quite vulnerable, and there's a lot of Russian opportunities for influence. And just a point on investigative journalism, there's some fantastic journalism that's going on in these countries. We have to support. It's not us making the news, but they are, they are being murdered because they're exposing corruption, which is the power base of Russian influence. So I cannot begin to tell you we need an offensive strategy on transparency, which is going investigative journalism, civil society. They are demanding something different. We need to help them and be the inspiration we once were. I have one quick question, and may, I don't, I'm running out of time, but how would you all assess Russia's meddling so far in this lead up to um, this week's European parliamentary, uh, parliament elections, and what would uh, y'all be considered, would y'all consider a win for Russia in these elections? I know you said it's one point in time. I don't want to go back on the, those eloquent words you said, ma'am, but um, if one of y'all could fill me in on that. I can start, you know, I, I think that there is uh, a degree of Russian interference across the board to support anti-establishment nationalist populist parties. So we recently had a, a amazingly uh, anti-immigrant party come to power uh, 
uh, as part of a ruling coalition in Estonia, where last year there were 5,200 immigrants, most of whom were former Estonian citizens that were coming back. It's just they don't have a migration problem. But, but these sorts of parties, they play to Russia's interests. And so Russia is supporting nationalist populist parties across the continent. I'd just pick up on that. One of the challenges, I think, in determining uh, the degree to which we're seeing Russian interference in Europe relates to a point that Ms. Conley mentioned earlier in her testimony previewing what to fear or worry about in terms of the U.S. 2020 elections. And that is that these operations, as they have been continuing over the years, have become more deeply embedded in the networks that are domestic networks. So whether that is on the financial side, whether that's on the information side, whether that's on the political or, or sort of social group side, these networks have become more entrenched. And so witting or unwitting, you have domestic actors that are engaging in activity that is very difficult to distinguish from the foreign activity. That's going to cause particular challenges over time as well on the information front in dealing with free speech. Because when it's a domestic actor that's simply carrying the message, it has much more significant implications than when we're just dealing with a foreign actor. So it's very difficult. There's been some great research that's looked at the degree to which there is this confluence of the Russian interference operations and the far right information environment in Europe that just came out a couple weeks ago, um, in particular looking at, at several countries. And I think that's really, as we're thinking about how these problems become compounding over time, why we need so concerned about acting now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've gone way over. I apologize. That's fine. Thank you. Good questions. Uh, Representative David Trone from Maryland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to follow up on Mr. Cicilline's question, uh, in 2017, uh, Germany passed novel legislation to put massive fines on social media companies that don't remove obvious criminal content within 24 hours. 2018, uh, based in large part on lessons learned in recent elections, France enacted a law that allows judges to block distribution of fake news you know, during an election. So what role can and should social media companies themselves play in, in deterring disinformation in these propaganda campaigns? I'm going to start with Mr. Manchester, Carpenter. Well, I think uh, Laura alluded to this point earlier that the platforms have an obligation to take fake content, fake accounts and bots uh, that engage in malicious behavior off of their off of their platforms. It's not so much if we're into policing content, uh, you know, as an American with First Amendment concerns, that that makes me squeamish. But when we look at fake activity, activity that is generated by by robots, uh, that's where the platforms need to be devoting the resources to weed that information out, weed those fake accounts off of their platforms, because that's sort of what what often generates the, the news cycle by amplifying some of the fake content that otherwise would just sort of fall uh, into uh, a void. One of the most important things that we could do, and Congress can play a role here, is to create a sustained information sharing mechanism between the government, law enforcement and intelligence community, and the platform companies. Basically what we have right now, if you want to go at this in a systemic way, the way that, that Dr. Carpenter just talked about it and that I alluded to earlier, going after the actors and their behavior, you need to have insights on what the bad guys are doing over in St. Petersburg or wherever they are. And that is law enforcement and the intelligence community that has particular insights into the nodes, networks, and pathways. But it's the platforms that have the information on what's actually happening, what the actual activity is, and how it's manifesting. You have to bring those two puzzle pieces together. Right now, that's happening on an ad hoc basis between certain parts of the US government and certain platforms. It needs to happen on a sustained and formalized basis in ways that protect privacy and speech. We have examples of this from the cybersecurity domain, the counterterrorism domain, and the financial integrity domain. It's beyond time for us to take these steps. I think that it's absolutely urgent, and Congress can actually take that step. Congressman, I would just say again, it is we need a fusion center. We're not structured to combat this. We need private sector engagement, and we need the combination. It's, it's treasury, it's justice, it's intelligence. We have to restructure ourselves. 
The other part of the equation, we have to do a much better job of public awareness. Uh, in my written testimony, I sort of suggested, you know, when, during the Second World War, we had a big public campaign, loose lips sinks ships, yep. which is sort of ridiculous. But if it's, you know, if it's not factually correct, you have to delete. We have to warn the American people. They have to know that this is about them, and they have to be much more uh, proactive. So it's getting our structural house in order, but it's also helping the American people understand that this battle space is taking place on their computer. Computers. Congressman, uh, one idea to take from your question here, uh, as some of our SEPA analysis has demonstrated, if we spend too much time obsessing about what the bots are doing, that's going to be a losing strategy. Uh, like I said, it costs the Russians pennies on the dollar to compete with us in this vector. Uh, what I do think we could do is to increase the networks uh, between, as we've heard, U.S. government and outside of government, between experts. Uh, information sharing is key, but also the public, if we think of this disinformation as a virus, the public needs to be better equipped to protect themselves and each other from communicating these kinds of information viruses. Thank you. Have you seen any ideas the EU or NATO have done to help uh, voters distinguish, you know, what's disinformation and from fact and opinion that's worked? I think the model for us to follow is the model from Finland and the Baltic states, which have been used to receiving Russian disinformation for decades and decades. And they, you know, so much so that Russia had a Finnish language uh, service on Sputnik that they canceled in 2014 because it simply wasn't getting through. So that's the ultimate sign of success is when they pull their programs because they're not getting through. But it, it comes from it comes from sort of being inoculated over the course of many many years to the fact that if there is questionable content in the media that hey that that may not be real that it may be a propaganda item that has been put into the public narrative and so it takes a sort of a, a sustained public uh, awareness raising campaign to to get that level of inoculation within the society thank you thank you uh, it's clear from this morning's testimony that uh, it's not enough to just take down a site. We're playing whack-a-mole in, in that instance, and we have to really treat it as a much deeper fusion effort that we have in so many other areas. Uh, now I'd like to recognize Representative and former Ambassador to Luxembourg, uh, Representative Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for hosting this hearing, and thank you to our witnesses for their time. In uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Russia has cultivated relationships with the Bosnian Serb community, including Milorad Dodik, a Bosnian Serb politician currently chairing uh, Bosnia's rotating presidency. Mr. Dodik has embraced an authoritarian Serb supremacist ideology and just last month claimed the 1995 Bosnian genocide at Srebrenica was a fabricated myth. Although Dodik and other Russian allies in the Bosnian Serb community opposed NATO membership, NATO foreign ministers agreed in December to begin the advice and uh, assistance program for Bosnia and Herzegovina. The Bosnian Croat and Bosniak presidents support NATO membership. Dr. Carpenter, how is Russia exploiting ethnic divisions to stall Bosnia's ascension to NATO, and what can the United States do to combat these very dangerous tactics? Well, Russia has always seen Bosnia and Herzegovina as a <laughs> soft target for its uh, influence operations, and certainly uh, President Dodik has traveled extensively to Moscow to confer and to consult with President Putin about the strategic direction of the country. He essentially presents a veto over Bosnia's ability to move forward with its membership action plan and actually join the NATO alliance. And so far as he's in power, or people like him in Republika Srpska, uh, it's hard to envisage that the country will actually be able to one day join either NATO, by the way, or the EU, because although they say that the EU is still a long-term strategic priority, I'm not so sure that when, when it actually comes to it, that people like Dodik will encourage the country to move forward. So we have to, you know, we have to try to work with those people inside Bosnia that want a better future. But for right now, you know, Dodik is fully supported by, by Putin. Uh, you know, the great latest example was the Night Wolves motorcycle gang, which is a Russian sort of Trojan horse, it's an intelligence front, was in 
uh, Banya Luka uh, with Dorek supporting him and, and offering uh, that sort of information support. So this is a long-term effort, but unfortunately it's, it is the goal that Putin sees for, for, by the way, for Ukraine and for Georgia is to have sort of Republika, mini Republika Srpskas in these other countries too, because they're a veto on their Euro-Atlantic integration. To that point, as some of our witnesses have pointed out, Russian policies in the Balkans are largely opportunistic and not strategic. Uh, in light of this, it is important not to overestimate Russia's ability to control events in foreign countries. But in aggravating ethnic tensions in the Balkans, Russia is playing with fire. Uh, Ms. Conley, how likely is it that Russia will inadvertently ignite a conflict in the Balkans that it can't control? Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, and many times Russia um, creates problems that only it can uniquely solve. Um, and I think this is very true in, in the Western Balkans. Former Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, General Scaparotti, has highlighted year after year his concern that the Western Balkans is particularly vulnerable, not only to Russian malign influence, but to instability. Many Americans don't know. We have 800 plus forces in Kosovo mm -hmm. today as part of a NATO mission in K4, and we cannot take stability in the Western Balkans for granted. The challenge is, I think, for both the EU and the US, we've allowed our presence to atrophy and others, Russia, China, as well as Turkey, Qatar, have uh, reintegrated and re-influenced uh, the, the region. We don't have, um, a, the Western Balkans is not a top priority in our foreign policy toolkit. In Bosnia in particular, which you highlight, the Dayton Accords now, which, which was designed to stop violence, which it did, it has now imprisoned Bosnia, that it cannot move forward. It cannot reform, which, is, which enlarges Dodik's ability to prevent Bosnia from joining the Euro-Atlantic community. So I believe this will be fueled by Russia to distract, to disrupt, to potentially fuel uh, a migration push towards mm -hmm. Europe, whatever it can do to distract. But this is unfinished business. This is weakness that Russia is simply exploiting. And because the US and the EU do not have clarity and strength of policy, it's, it's, it's being allowed to happen. So I, I, this is an area of, of huge concern. Um, the problem is Mr. Dodik's getting so much play because there's not a lot of forces to push against him. I've got some questions about Latvia and Estonia, um, which I will um, submit especially to you, Mr. Uh, Duran, but um, my time has, has uh, lapsed and I yield back. Well, thank you, Representative. And I think that uh, this committee will be uh, focusing on those areas that you brought up, uh, the very important areas going forward that need greater attention and, and we will be uh, delving into those issues as this committee goes forward in this Congress. Uh, I'd like to uh, call upon a vice chairman uh, of the committee, Representative Abigail Spanberger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today. My question is to follow up on the discussion related to civic engagement that I know has been the thread of a lot of the discussion and questions so far. Um, I'm directing these specifically to Ms. Connolly and Ms. Rosenberger, but I welcome the other two uh, witnesses to, to add anything to this discussion. The European Union's East Stratcom Task Force, established in 2015, seeks to raise awareness of Russian disinformation and to educate the public about disinformation and improve media literacy overall, particularly when it comes to the internet and social media. The Swedish government, for example, instituted a nationwide digital competence curriculum for elementary school aged children, teaching them how to spot fake news and discern the difference between reliable and unreliable sources. As a former intelligence officer with CIA, but also as a mother of three young children, I do believe our national security strength begins with the American people, especially with our children. Um, and that means ensuring they have the necessary education and tools to make objective, evidence-based decisions. So do you all believe the European Union's approach in focusing on education and public awareness training, and especially with a pivot towards programs focused on children, can be or is an effective strategy to counter disinformation? And are there any other countries pursuing this type of program that you've been um, aware of that you think are successful that we should try and learn from? Well, thank you. I think those are really important questions. I would note just a couple of points. 
Um, the first is that I think this idea of building resiliency here at home is absolutely critical to dealing with so many of these challenges, whether that's resiliency of our financial system on some of the tactics we were speaking about earlier, or resilience on the information side. Um, these are vulnerabilities in our own societies that are being exploited, and we need to recognize that. Public awareness and education is absolutely a, a big part of that. I would sort of parcel them out into two different pieces. Public awareness about the threat requires real, consistent, strategic messaging. Um, Dr. Uh, Ms. Conley mentioned earlier you know, some of the, the programs we've seen on the counterterrorism front. Um, I think it is very important that we think about simple messages that we can replicate. Um, Sweden, uh, I think, may have been mentioned earlier as an example to look at um, for some of the tactics that they have used. Um, you mentioned the, the awareness campaigns, um, but they've also done a lot of really good work up and down the board um, at raising public awareness. The one thing I would say that the East Stratcom team has focused a good bit of their energy on is on debunking specific um, uh, specific stories, um, false narratives. Um, I would suggest that the research shows that that is of limited utility, um, and that in fact, it sometimes it risks ero um, actually amplifying the content you're seeking to debunk. I believe there is a threshold level at which it is imperative for governments to step in and and sort of demythologize some of those narratives, but I would argue that that's not the path to go down. The last point I would make, though, is while I think that <laughs> focusing on our children is extremely important, most of the research shows that, in fact, it is senior citizens, um, people who age 60 to 65 and older, depending on which study you look at, that have been the most vulnerable to mis- and disinformation. And so I think we can't discount looking at that part of the population, which has not grown up with so much technology in their lives that may not be as accustomed to using it, and that we need to make sure that we don't focus so much on just the younger generation that we lose sight of the other parts of the population that remain vulnerable. Thank you again for the question. I, I think the EU Stratcom, um, it, it's a good thought. It's so under-resourced, sort of buried. Um, it's not proactive. NATO's Strategic Communications Center, I would argue, um, is, is certainly giving us leading tools of what's happening, but you're right, the public education component is missing. Sweden is the perfect model. I don't know of other EU countries that have done sort of a similar at the grade school level work, and I think they see it as a part of what they, their defense concept, as you may well know, is total defense. It's about civilian defense, that everyone is responsible for defending the nation, and it begins with them individually. That's preparing your home in case of disaster, uh, that's, but that's also preparing your mind for being influenced uh, inappropriately. So we have to somehow message that patriotism and public awareness, that this is something that goes together, um, as I mentioned in my, my uh, written statement and my oral statement, we are at war. It's just a different kind of war, and we have to convince people that they have to take personal responsibility and making sure that what they're reading or what they're hearing from families and, and friends, is that right? Do I have the right information? How can you be a truth detective, if you will? And that's part of our patriotic duty, but we have to put it, I think, in those terms. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you very much. I, I believe that given its history, Estonia as well has instituted from the first grade level even uh, uh, some of this education on young people as well. So I just want to thank uh, our witnesses here. Uh, we've touched upon the surface, uh, yet I think we've done so in a way that uh, actually had us arrive at solutions and paths forward that we can have. So uh, I want to thank all of you for making that part of your testimony as well. There is a path forward. There are things we can do domestically. There are things we can do, particularly information sharing uh, with our allies in Europe. There are lessons learned there that we can go forward uh, to deal with what is a major threat. And today we had the opportunity to amplify something that's so often overlooked as a threat. Uh, the involvement of Russia in uh, public corruption, political corruption, and financial uh, corruption. Uh, there's much to do going forward, but yeah, your testimony here I think created a great foundation for us to pursue. So with that, I want to uh, adjourn this hearing and thank all the members that took time out of an extremely busy day. Uh, you saw people coming in and coming out, but uh, we had great participation. I want to thank you and uh, adjourn this hearing. Thank you. Because I think pretty much everybody flowed through at some point. They were good. They gave